planets around other stars are something that's extremely interesting. And one of the ways we, we want to study these planets is by doing something called transit spectroscopy. So we what we're doing is as a planet passes in front of its star, we see how that light is actually blocked. So just think about putting sunglasses on um, or watching you know, a lunar eclipse uh, or a solar eclipse even, you can see how the light of the sun is actually being blocked. And this is what we're actually studying when we're looking at exoplanets as they transit in front of their star. So by how much light is actually blocked, we can know how big that planet is, but we can also study the atmosphere and what it's made of. And so the first planet that we actually looked at was a planet called WASP-96b. So this is an extremely big planet. It's, it's bigger than Jupiter, but it's only about half the mass of Jupiter, which means it's got a huge puffy atmosphere. That atmosphere is full of what we believe to be hot water, which is what we actually were able to observe and as shown here in the James Webb Space Telescope spectrum. Um, so what you're seeing is a series of hills and valleys as this planet passed in front of its star. We were able to determine that the composition of this planet's atmosphere was water. What was surprising about this first spectrum, though, is that the hills and valleys aren't as big as we thought they were going to be. And that means there's probably clouds or other things happening in this planet's atmosphere that we had no idea were happening before. So what we have to do is understand what that environment looks like. Is it something like Jupiter with great red spot and giant clouds um, sort of streaking across the, the sky? Or is it something a bit more transparent or maybe diffuse? Um, understanding what the composition of these planets' atmospheres look like is a really a keen interest to us to understand if there's other planets that might have a composition that look like Earth's. Um, or maybe they look like Titan, or maybe they look like Jupiter. These are all extreme unknowns and sort of our quest with uh, discoveries um, that are to come with the James Webb Space Telescope. Well, since this planet was observed, we also observed another planet within this uh, that was close by. This is WASP 39b. Um, and again, this is actually published science results. So this is our first spectrum that was actually obtained. And what we were able to do is we, we looked at this planet and again, as it passed in front of its star, we watched how that starlight was actually blocked when the planet went in front of it. And then we looked with extreme detail at different wavelengths how much that light was actually blocked. And we were able to then determine that carbon dioxide actually existed in the atmosphere of this particular planet. Carbon dioxide is something that had never been observed in a planet outside of our solar system before. So this was considered a huge achievement for us uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope, as well as for the science community studying planets around other stars. The other way we study exoplanets is by watching the, um, trying to study the planets directly themselves. So instead of them passing in front of the star, we try to image them directly. So the way we do that is if we point the telescope at the star, but then we put a giant lens in front of that starlight so that we can see anything that's fainter in the nearby vicinity, such as planets. Um, and sometimes we even get lucky enough that we see planets with moons. Um, we're not quite there yet with the James Webb Space Telescope, but we were able to image our first planet. And we did so around the star called HIP 65426. Um, and the planet was actually B, the B planet of this particular system. And so what you're seeing is the different um, camera filters that we have with the James Webb Space Telescope on the bottom here, showing you a different wavelengths of light that we've actually imaged this planet in. So by imaging at different wavelengths, we can also understand what the composition of that planet may or may not be. And then we can start to dissertain things like, you know, whether or not this planetary system has a puffy atmosphere uh, or this planet has an atmosphere whether it's more terrestrial or a solid type of planet. Um, these are the kinds of things we're really interested in studying. Um, the funny shapes that you're seeing um, as far as within the images themselves just has to do with how they, the images were acquired with the different cameras and the filters that we have with the James Webb Space Telescope. 
and I assure you they are all point sources, um, tiny little planets. Um, and this is something that um, we're, we're just starting to understand how these filters are working as we're doing these imaging. Uh, the star is showing you where the star would actually be in these images that we've blocked out with our technology. But we've also been studying things a lot closer to home, including the giant planet in our solar system, Jupiter. So Jupiter is something we can see with our own eyes, just walking out on a dark night, moonless night mostly. Um, and you can see this big, beautiful planet with your own eyes. We have spacecraft currently orbiting Jupiter and taking absolutely amazing images in details that we aren't able to see with most telescopes. Um, so what you're seeing here are some images that were actually taken with ground-based telescopes in the top left. Um, these are at two different wavelengths. One is at visible light on the left. Um, the reddish one is actually at infrared light, so something that we are studying with the James Webb Space Telescope. And then the large image is actually from the Juno mission, um, showing you the beautiful structure of the atmosphere of Jupiter and highlighting the great red spot. Well, we were able to look at Jupiter with the James Webb Space Telescope and study it in beautiful amounts of detail. Um, not only do we see all that fantastic structure in the atmosphere with the James Webb Space Telescope with our resolution, and surprisingly, with the extreme amount of sensitivity of JWST, Jupiter wasn't too bright to actually look at. Um, in fact, we were able to see things that we haven't been able to study in a lot of detail, um, especially with remote telescopes or telescopes on Earth or those such as the Hubble Space Telescope before. What we're seeing now are rings that are being totally illuminated and lit up in ways that we can now see readily with the James Webb Space Telescope. The smaller moons that are harder to see with our naked eye, and even some of the aurora um, of the of this giant planet. The great red spot looks bright white in this image, and that's just because it's emitting at extreme temperatures that are quite hot and showing us the, the different amount of radiation coming from that particular storm. And most, the fun part about this image is all these little dots in the background. Um, these are all actually photobombing galaxies in the background of this image. And something that we don't see very routinely with a lot of uh, ground-based telescopes when we look at planets in our solar system, just because most of them are blocked from a lot of light that we can't see. And of course, you can blow this image up and use different filters of, of wavelength and understand all the different things and dynamics that are happening. But in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. Yesterday, we revealed Mars with the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, Mars is actually the brightest thing, one of the brightest objects the James Webb Space Telescope will ever observe. It is the brightest infrared object in our night sky, in our own solar system and probably one of the brightest objects we will study, um, even in our own galaxy. So what you're seeing here um, are the two images on the right are the ones from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, they're at different wavelengths of light, and they're basically showing you the heat being mapped across the surface of Mars. Um, and so we have sort of an image to show you what we're looking at. Um, within these two images. And one of the fun parts about this is we actually focus in on the Huygens crater. crater. Um, and what we're seeing in these heat maps um, is we can actually see that that crater has a different temperature within it. Um, this is really amazing. And even the Hellas Basin also has a different temperature. This is because they're actually lower in altitude. So you can think as you go up a mountain, the altitude gets a lot higher, the air gets a lot thinner, and it also gets a lot colder. So as we go down towards the ocean, the air gets a lot thicker. And what we're seeing is that thicker amount of air causing this sort of heat to be um, perceived in these, in these craters. So the crater up here on the top compared to the Hellas Basin here on the bottom, um, we can definitely start seeing some of these things. It is a really hard observation to do because it is so bright. We tend to saturate most of our wavelengths. And that was shown in the spectra that we have here. Um, so when you're seeing the spectrum sort of cut off on the bottom, that means it's actually saturating with light. There's so much of that particular molecule at that wavelength 
that it's saturating our cameras, um, just like staring your own camera um, at the sun, for example, it would you would only see white light. Um, but we were able, able to see some of the other molecules in the atmosphere of Mars, including water and carbon dioxide, as well as carbon monoxide. Um, so with these type of spectra, what we can do is we can synthesize maps um, just the same way as we did with the thermal imaging or the heat maps. While we haven't done this quite yet with these data, we have run some simulations. So what you're seeing are some simulations of what we can and hope to do with the James Webb Space Telescope maps, um, showing you water maps and carbon dioxide maps that we hope to try to, to pull out of these data. Um, and a comparison is what we have actually mapped from the ground. Um, this is actually a methane map that was done with ground-based telescopes in 2009 um, at infrared wavelengths. So hopefully this is the type of science that's coming out of these observations and stay tuned. <laughs>